Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Back Row YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. If you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I am joined by the economist, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks. Hopefully, um, I'll be a good substitute teacher for Mark today. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to I'm sure you're going to do just great. Um, I've got a really fun episode planned for us here. So this is a this is a really fun time of the year to be recording podcasts because we're exiting the old year, getting into the new year. Um, and you and I were just discussing how there's been a, a slew of recent articles in the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal about how everyone got their predictions wrong uh, in 2023. So we thought we'd start off the new year by doing uh, giving you wrong predictions about 2024 uh, and exploring some of the big sort of uh, macro trends. Um, so may- maybe to just uh, get into uh, this coming year, uh, first of all, why do you think everyone got things so wrong in 2023? Um, and are we setting ourselves up to do that in 2024 when everyone has sort of shifted bullish? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of reasons why, you know, I'd even back you up and say that the 2022 forecast for 20, um, for, you know, were were equally as wrong too about that was the old transitory inflation forecast back then. Um, I think that there's a couple of reasons. I have, you know, and this get to the bigger picture we're going to probably unfold. I've argued that every so often you get events in the world that produce changes in the trends of the economies of the world. The last one was 2008, the financial crisis. I think the lockdown restart of the economy in 2020 has a long tail of changing a lot of things. And I think part of the reason that the forecasts have been so wrong is most people don't think that's the case. We keep using the words normalization and rebalancing and uh, and you even hear people just outright say it's going to be just like 2019 again. And so they don't think that that throwing 14 million people out of work, calling them all back to work, sending them money, putting them in lockdown for for months, that we're all just going to shrug our shoulders and go, whatever, that was 2019, that was 2020. Let's just continue as the way things always were. I don't think we are going to continue as the way things always were. And every time I bring this up, I have to say, I'm talking about it being different. I'm not talking about it being worse. I'm not talking about it being dystopian. And that's why I think the forecasts are wrong, because the base in all these forecasts is we're going back to 2019. That's pre-pandemic. And we don't. And that's why we think we get them so wrong all the time. All right, everyone, we will be back to the program in just a moment. But before we do, I wanted to give you the inside scoop about something that we've been cooking up at BlockWorks these last couple of months. So in March of this coming year, in London, BlockWorks is going to be gathering 1,200 of the world's largest asset managers, so that's fund managers and allocators, financial institutions, think big banks, payment providers, et cetera, and professional traders at the largest institutionally focused conference in digital assets, DAS London. Now, it's very rare that you get the likes of JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Point72, the large HFTs, the family offices all in one room at the same time. So if you want to know what the big money is doing in digital assets these days, this is the conference for you. To give you an early sneak peek at some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, one, the intersection of macro and digital assets. And where are we in the market cycle? We're going to be talking about real world assets, so that's stable coins, on-chain treasuries, all that fun stuff. And we're going to be talking about things from the allocator perspective. So what are the big money managers? in crypto doing these days. And because you are such a good listener of On The Margin, I'm giving you an extra code MARGIN20. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, use code MARGIN20, and I will see you in sunny London town in March. Maybe we can use the 2020 period as a jumping off point and explore some of the big secular changes that we're seeing going forward. So one thing that I've heard you say, and this is, you know, gets talked about quite a lot on, on FinTwit and in financial circles, is the end of the 40-year bull market in bonds. Now, there's been quite an enormous amount of focus on bonds this year. I've seen many charts that you've put out that this is, um, you know, it's been a it's been a terrible year for for bonds in general. And the question is now going into 2024, obviously, the Fed has signaled that they're 
uh, shifting their tune a little bit. Maybe we can look forward to rate cuts a bit. Uh, the 10 year is down, you know, 120 basis points or whatever it is from the peaks around 5%. So do you think that, you know, give us the, your sort of secular outlook on bonds. Um, are we done with the 40 year bull market um, or are we going to uh, see a little bit of a resurgence there? So the 40 year bull market in bonds, I think ended in August of 2020. It started in, in September of 1981. Let me start there. When we hit 15.8% on the 10-year yield. Yeah, we did. We hit 15.8% in September of 1981. And it ended in August of 2020 when we hit half a percent or 50 basis points. Then from August of 2020 until late October of this year, just a few months ago, we went to 5%, over 5%. The losses in the bond market for that period and especially if you were to just look at 22 and, and all the way to October of 23, were cumulatively the worst losses in the bond market since the Civil War. I mean, literally, that was the worst bond market in 160 years. And now in the last two months, we've had a giant rebound. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is every reaction in a market is, is incumbent upon its previous action. So if you had the worst sell-off since the Civil War, the rebound is not going to be eight basis points. It's going to be the best market in 40 years. That's the way that these markets tend to work, is that when you have a giant sell-off, your rebound is big. When you have a giant rally, your sell-off is big. And so that's what I think has happened in the bond market. Now, where are we in, in, in the market? We've had a big rally in, in the bond market. Seems like a lot of people are really bullish on bonds. I don't think we've broken that uh, uptrend in yields. I don't think that the 40-year bull market is reasserting itself. I think we're in year four of a multi-year bear market in bonds. Now, that we're in a multi-year bear market in bonds, now, that doesn't mean – I the, the thing people have to remember about bonds that's very different from other types of assets like crypto and like stocks is bonds have a big yield now. You can get a 5% yield in lots of places and – corporate land and in the short end of the treasury yield curve. That yield needs to be managed. That yield is going to provide a big cushion. So we could have another up leg in interest rates in 2024 and still end the year with a positive total return because we're back to the way bonds used to be when they had a big yield. So I think that the trend ended. I think we're in an upward, upward tilt. Uh, on the 40-year um, on bonds, and it's going to last several more years. Now, along the way, you will have probably a recession in there somewhere, and you will have a two-year rally in bonds. But I think that if you were to ask me where bonds are going to be in 10 years or 15 years, I think they're going to be much higher in yield than we are today. And Jim, what are the forces that are driving the bond market in, say, 2024? I'd say when you when you look at 2023, obviously supply, especially at the long end of the curve, was an incredibly powerful dynamic. There's been a lot of focus on the quarterly refunding announcements, certainly more than there's been in the past. And then, of course, there's the Federal Reserve. So this last FOMC presser, uh, you know, Powell sort of shifted pretty dovish, right? And now the market is pricing in, I think, uh, three three cuts the following year. So are those the two forces that are going to be in the driver's seat for bonds this coming year, or is there something else? Yeah, there's a third one, and that's going to be the inflation outlook. But you know, you're right. It, the supply situation is going to continue to be a big issue in the bond market. There's going to be more supply issued in 2024 than there was in 2023. Um, so that is going to weigh on the market. The Fed is signaling that they're done raising rates and that they're going to pivot. Um, Deutsche Bank put out a good piece about a month or two ago that pointed out that this is the seventh pivot that the market has priced in. So maybe the seventh time is the charm. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is the Fed says a lot of stuff. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Inflation is transitory. Jay Paul famously said that, you know, basically hinted that there will be pain in August in, in August of 2022 when he gave his eight-minute speech at Jackson Hole. In March of this year, right before the banks failed, he basically told us that the funds rate was going to 6%. And they reversed that literally two days later after Silicon Valley Bank um, failed. So they say lots of things about what they think is going to happen. And sometimes it comes to pass and sometimes it doesn't. Now that I've said that, I'm not being critical of the Fed. 
You can, I can give you a forecast of the future. You can have a forecast of the future. The Fed can have a forecast of the future, but we don't know what it's going to be. And if it turns out differently, we have to adjust. The only way it turns out the way the Fed thinks is they say, we're going to make a decision. We're going to cut rates three times. And I don't care if the world ends, we're still going to cut rates three times. That would be catastrophically bad. So they give you their best guess. And then we see how things play out. By the way, the Fed's dot chart is said that they want to cut rates three times. The market is priced in six rate cuts for next year, and they're working on a seventh. Now, what's interesting about that is there's eight Fed meetings in a year, and the January 31st meeting only has about a 15% chance the Fed's going to raise, uh, cut rates at that meeting. So basically not. That means the market is saying they're going to cut rates at every meeting in 2024 all the way through the election cycle. And that would be unusual for the Fed to say, we're going to cut interest rates every single meeting in an election year. Now, they do move in election years. They did in 2020 because they're forced to because circumstances demand it. So mm. we'll see if circumstances demand it. Like 2008, they had to cut rates a lot because we were the world economy was imploding because of the financial crisis. 2020, they cut rates to zero quickly because the world economy was imploding because of COVID. Now, if we don't have some kind of a global crisis, will they really cut rates every single meeting in all the way through the election year? I kind of have my doubts that they would do that unless you tell me, no, the economy is going to get really bad and that's why they're going to have to do it. Right now, I don't see that happening with the economy. So I, I want to get your forecast on real rates as well. And maybe we can touch on your prognosis for inflation. So one of the things I think that happened this year, and this was an objective, uh, this was a policy objective of uh, Chair Powell is to move real interest rates across the curve into positive territory. And I think they peaked, uh, you know, you had 10 year break evens at two and a half percent, and it's essentially been down from there. So where do you see real rates going in 2024 and beyond? Uh, you know, did we see the peak this year? Um, and then ultimately, maybe we can touch on your sort of inflation prognosis there as well. Yeah. So <clears throat> real rates, of course, are the interest rate that you get after inflation. The Treasury does issue a security called the Treasury Inflation Protected Security. And what that bond does, if you buy that Treasury bond, is it pays you the inflation rate plus a yield. Now, how do they do that? If you buy $100 worth of those bonds uh, and uh, the inflation rate over the next year is 3%, they give you more bonds every month. So you'd wind up with $103 worth of bonds in a year. And then you get the 1.8 or 2% inflation rate on top of, on, on real rate, excuse me, on top of whatever the inflation um, rate is. Now, real rates from 2009 to 2020 averaged about 25 basis points, one quarter of 1%. And for a large part of that period, they were negative. Real rates were below zero. So you were getting, you were paying the government back some of those bonds that they were giving you in terms of uh, negative real rates. We kind of got used to that. And I think that that was a mistake. We anchored ourselves off that period because when real rates went positive, you know, earlier in the year and eventually went over 2%, you heard a lot of people in the marketplace say the Fed has to cut rates because the inflation rate's coming down. If interest rates hold steady and the inflation rate comes down, real rates expand, and that will put a pain or a crimp on the economy. Now, the assumption, again, the anchor that you're making is that somehow whatever happened between 2009 and 2020, when we were at virtually zero, was normal. But if you look at real rates before 2009, before the QE period, they averaged about two and three quarters percent. And the economy was fine. We had bull markets. We had, um, you know, an expanding economy. We had increasing standards of living with 2 and 3% real rates. But today now we've decided that if real rates were to ever approach 25 it would summarily cause a deflationary bust in the economy. I think that's completely off base. I think that the economy can handle real rates at these levels and even higher. And it's showing it has handled those rates fine because if you look at economic growth through 2023, it's actually been above average. 
And for most sectors of the of the economy, it is handled that very well. So that's what real rates are about. And I guess really the question comes down to is what do you consider normal? I think a lot of people look at 2009 to 2020 and go, oh my God, look how high they are. And I look at look at where they were before 2009, before QE. They're actually still below the average of what we saw in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And so I don't think that real rates are at some punishing level that's going to require the Fed to give relief because I don't see it. I don't see any evidence that those real rates have been punishing right now. Yeah. So, Jim, where does that sort of set you up for the stock market going into 2024? So real rates obviously have an enormous impact on equity valuations. I just I just got done listening to Joseph Wang's prognosis or forecast for 2024. Now, Joseph Wang was one of the few analysts that got 2023 basically directionally correct. He was a bull going into 2023 when I think I think it was 100 percent of Bloomberg economists that were surveyed were bearish going into the year. So I just got done listening to Joseph Wang essentially say, I think we're in the middle of, you know, to, to drastically oversimplify his forecast. Uh, he's still bearish long term on bonds, similarly to you. Uh, he called for, I think, 6,000 on the S&P um, and th- essentially thinks we're in the middle of sort of a, a crack up boom. So what's your sort of prognosis for the stock market going into 2024? It's interesting you brought up uh, Joseph because I watched his 2024 forecast and I found myself agreeing with everything he said except the stock market. Oh, but really? everything, right. <laughs> everything else he said, I agreed with. And and I have a fundamental, here's my difference with the stock market. Let me start off by saying that uh, Dr. Jeremy Siegel put out an update to his great book, one of the best investment books ever written, Stocks for the Long Run. There's a new edition of it out this year. And in that edition, and I'll summarize this, he says, what is the long-term return prospects for the stock market? You buy stocks, and you do the Warren Buffett thing. Don't even look at them for five years and then value them in 10 or 15 years. What should you expect? And the simple answer is about an 8% return, eight. Um, Okay, in 2019, if you were looking at the stock market and saying, look, you could expect about an 8% return, what is your alternative? Well, you got a money market fund at zero. Well, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna put my money in stocks because the expected return is 800 basis points more than a money market fund. Okay, now, but what about in late 2023? What's your alternative? That money market fund is yielding 5.4%. According to S&P, that's the average money market fund yield in the United States, about 53 5.4%. Um, if 8% is still the long-term pr- prognosis for the stock market, now remind everybody that your return for the last two years in the stock market has been zero. You were down big in 22, you were up big in 23. We're almost to the penny exactly where we were on December 29th, 2021, the day we're recording. Um, If your long-term prognosis in the stock market is 8%, uh, then this alternative like money funds and bond funds are offering you like two thirds to 70% of the return that the stock market would give you. That's a very different scenario. How much risk are you willing to take to get that final third or final 30%? And the answer I think is you're gonna be not as much as you were in 2019. And that's why if you look at the flows, there's been huge flows in the bond funds and there hasn't been that big a flow in the stock funds this year. Uh, And that's because the bond market's giving me most of what the stock market is going to offer in terms of yield without nearly as much market risk. Uh, And that's why you've seen people being pushed into yield, especially at the short end of the yield curve, where you don't have very much price risk, like in a money market fund. Now, why did I bring all that up? Because what has been the defining characteristic of the stock market in 2023? Interest rates. So let's look at just the fourth quarter alone. The stock market, we all forgot this, I know because we're pennies away from an all-time high in the S&P as we talk, But in late October, it had corrected 10% from its July high. So July to October, the stock market fell 10%. What happened during that period? Well, you got third quarter earnings. Over half the S&P companies reported by late October. On balance, those companies reported pretty good earnings numbers. 
showing that the economy was in pretty decent shape. What did the stock market do as one company after another kept reporting? It went down, it went down, it went down. What stopped the stock market going down? The November 1st quarterly funding announcement that was perceived as positive and the November 14th CPI report for October, which was better than expected, bonds took off and stocks took off with them. So if you were to say, here's a whole bunch of analysis on the, on the economy and hundreds of earnings reports, and they're all good, or here's a bond rally, the stock market is saying, you keep your analysis and your earnings reports, give me a bond rally, because it's all about the competition for stocks. So as bonds rallied and yields went down, stocks took off. So if the economy stays stronger than expected, Joseph said that, I agree with him. Inflation might stay stickier than people think. That's been my forecast. Joseph was arguing that bond yields might go back to 5%. I'm at 5.5 for next year, but let's just not quibble about the 50 basis points difference. A five handle. I think that if you did that, the stock market has got a problem. You could give me a thousand good earnings reports. You could give me good payroll reports. You could give me good GDP reports. But people will look and go, I can still get most of the stock market's returns without the risk. Thank you very much. You can keep your SPYs and you can keep your IWMs. That's the Russell 2000 ETF. I'm not interested in taking that extra risk. So I think it's going to continue to be about interest rates. That's what is the driver in this market. And that is what will continue to be the driver. So higher rates will be a headwind. Now I said a headwind. I didn't mean it's going to collapse. It's going to be all over the, you know, be ugly, but it will be a problem for the stock market if rates were to go higher in 2024. So um, if, if I could just poke at that maybe for a second. So on the one hand, maybe provide like a, a bull and bear case for that. One thing that I've been, um, you know, pointed out a couple of times on on the show before is that this just reminds me so much of almost like the the mini double top that we had in in crypto in 2020, <laughs> 2021 timeframe where you had it looked like a peak, then it sold off quite a bit. And then it looked like you were getting back to all time highs and it just kissed the all time highs. And then it was sort of down only. And one thing that's made me a little bit nervous, um, you know, we know that consensus forecasts tend to be wrong. And going into this year, 2023, everyone thought it was going to be a horrible year. It ended up being a great year. And one thing that I would just mark again, yeah, we're recording this on December 29th. It feels like everyone has shifted extremely bullish. And those are the types of setups that you get uh, sort of downward surprise. But one thing, uh, maybe, Jim, I'd love to get your thoughts just going into this year. You know, we also had uh, an, an environment where bonds were selling off. We had rising rates, but the stock market still did uh, extremely well. Um, so what would you say to, to that? Because it is possible for the stock market to do well when even when yields are going up. Right. Just a quick comment about consensus forecasts. The, the argument to be made is why are they always wrong, consensus forecasts? Because that's what's priced into the market. So usually when everybody agrees on something, you can say, good, it's already in the price. The pro now we're waiting for something we don't expect to put in the price, and that's why consensus forecasts are wrong. But you never know which way, which direction they are. But I would push back on your pushback by saying, let's go back to late October. Uh, and if you look at the stock market, it was up like 7% for the year in the S&P. If you took out the AI, seven AI stocks, it was actually the S&P 493 was down on the year by late October. The Russell 2000, was uh, was actually lower than its 2022 low in late October. That's how bad it had performed. Mid-cap stocks were down. So if you say there's 6,000 stocks in the United States, seven companies, which have $9 trillion of market cap, were up 45%. The other 5,993 as a group were down on the year through the end of October. Then interest rates turned around and they all took off because that's the driver of this. So I would argue that that was the narrative in the market. The AI stocks are probably the, the Magnificent Seven, as we call them, are probably at this point the most interest rate immune stocks that there are in the market. They are on their own narrative and their narrative is not as dependent on interest rates as everything else is. So what I argued we'll see in 24 is a continuation 
of what we've seen in 23. And that was that everything but those AI stocks were really dependent upon interest rates. Now, look, I could be wrong and rates could go to three and a quarter. And that's which way case you'll have a great year in the stock market. But I think if the rates tr- um, make their way back to 5%, even on the case of decent earnings reports in a decent economy, and I kind of think that that might be what we'll see in 24, I think that the competition that that the bond market provides for the stock market is not going to get people to throw their hands in the air and say, we all got to go in the stocks. One last thing for you, um, I'll throw out, and I've been kind of hinting about this. For the last 25 years, we've anchored everybody again, and we've trained everybody, stop picking stocks, buy SPY, buy IWM, buy broad-based indices. And, And that worked great. But I think we are now in a period where that kind of broad-based buying is coming to an end and that we're going to return back to a stock-picking world where it's not going to be you have to be in stocks. It's going to be which stocks are you in and why are you in those stocks? And so, the as I joke, Peter Lynch, who's probably known as the most famous of all stock pickers who's ever lived outside of maybe Warren Buffett, um, he could come out of retirement now because we need his skills again um, because we're back to a stock picking world. I know most people listening to this go, what the hell are you talking about? The S&P was up 20%. Yeah, because 30% of the S&P is seven stocks. And that's the most concentrated it's been in 60 years. There could be a year, maybe next year, maybe the year after, where the S&P could be down 8%, but the 493 are up 10 you know, and so you could basically said, look, I could have I could have done the Dave Portnoy thing and picked letters out of a Scrabble bag to buy stock. <laughs> but as long as I stayed away from the index itself, I did well. That that could that's the inverse of what we had this year. Um, so that could be very well coming um, as well, too. So I think that the stock picking is going to make a comeback, by the way. My friend Mike Green pushes back about that, that the the ETF is the um uh, is the uh, extraordinary tool that we like to use to buy uh, funds, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, by investments, excuse me. And I think that the answer to that is going to be that people might use actively managed ETFs are going to make, are probably going to become very popular in the next few years. So where does that stock picker come from? that stock picker comes through a a new ETF. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Jim, I, I know you launched your own ETF recently, so I want to I want to bookmark this and return uh, to that idea. First of all, congratulations on that. I understand that it's going well. And I want to return to that at the end of the episode here. Um, and folks should definitely look out for that. But I wanted to get your opinion on the Bitcoin ETF and crypto writ large going into the coming year. So um, walk us through what you think about the Bitcoin ETF, which I believe the final decision is it's less than 10 days away uh, now that we're that we're due for our iShares Bitcoin ETF. So, A, how would you handicap that? It seems, um, you know, knock on wood, like it's probably coming at this point. But, you know, how do you view it as a maybe buy the rumor, sell the news event? I know Dan Moorhead came out and said it's a buy the rumor, buy the news. You know, what are your sort of thoughts on the Bitcoin ETF going into 24? So, first of all, let me just lay out. I am bullish on the crypto space. I have been for years and I continue to be for years. And I think DeFi has got a tremendous amount of promise to be the next financial system. So don't forget that because now I'm going to shit on all of it (laughs) for the next five minutes. (laughs) Uh, You know, uh, and so my two biggest concerns are, yes, January 8th to 10th is the next deadline that everybody expects that the Bitcoin ETF will be approved. I think so, too. But if I was to give you a nuance on it, there are 14 Bitcoin ETFs plus Grayscale's conversion. 
Uh, I'm going to handicap that at least 13 of them will be approved on January 8th to 10th. The, there is a tremendous first mover advantage in the ETF space. He who goes first wins. And so the SEC does not want to be accused of playing favoritism to BlackRock or anybody else. Look no further than the Ethereum futures ETFs. There were nine of those. They all got approved on the same day too. So they're going to basically they're going to basically either give us the biggest rug we've seen in a while in the in the crypto space on January eighth, or they're going to say all of you guys are approved. You can all list tomorrow. You can all go for it, and then we'll all start figuring out well which one of these are we going to buy. The possible exception in that might be the grayscale conversion from a closed end fund to an ETF, but I suspect that that should go um, as well too. And so we'll see. And then you'll have BlackRock and you'll have ARC. You'll have Grayscale. These are all the big ones. You'll have a bunch of secondary ones that'll probably try to compete on lower price. And we'll ch- then we'll have to see how all of that plays out. So that's what I think will happen on January 8th, although there is a, a small chance that the SEC might try and rug everybody by not approving it. But boy, you could see everybody's frothing at the mouth expecting that that's what's going to happen. Now, what's it going to mean for the market? Well, Galaxy's put out a report that said $14 billion of new money is going to flow into the um, in the sector with these ETFs. Tom Lee's a little bit more optimistic on it. He's got $25 billion. Okay, so there's your range of 14 to $25 billion. Here's the issue I have with it. There are, there are about 150 uh, crypto ETFs in the world today. Most of them are either futures-based in the U.S., there are spot ones outside of the U.S. in foreign countries. Collect, and then you've got Grayscale, you've got Coinbase, and you've got MicroStrategies. All those 160 ETFs with Grayscale, MicroStrategies, and Coinbase collectively have about $110 billion of assets. Conservatively speaking, since June 15th, June 15th was the BlackRock filing of the uh, spot beat ETF. About eight to ten billion dollars has flowed in to the, into the into that space through those already existing trad five vehicles. Now add in Ethereum and Bitcoin futures, and you've got another two to five billion dollars, depending on how you want to measure it, that has flowed in since mid June. So Galaxy's argument of fourteen billion is right. It's already happened. It's already happened. We're most of the way towards. Um, Tom Lee's $25 billion number. This is what markets do. They don't sit there and wait for the announcement. They find ways to front run it. And the ways to front run it is there's 160 Bitcoin ETFs, there's MicroStrategies, Coinbase, and there's there's the, the Grayscale Trust already. The Grayscale Trust in June had a 44% discount. Today, it is a 5% discount. That's how much it's relevant. And by the way, if you look at those investments, um, you know, uh, Coinbase is up like like 200 percent. Grayscale is up like 180 percent. MicroStrategies is up over 100 percent. I'm talking about since June, since the filing. And Bitcoin's up like 68 percent. These things have two X or three X, the return of Bitcoin, because so much TradFind money is plowed into it. So all of your assumptions on what's going to go into this space are correct. It's already happened. That's why I fear that there's going to be the sell the news event when this happens. Now, maybe not January 9th, but you're waiting for a big ton of money. They've already priced it in. The price is already in the mid 40,000s to ex- to expect that to come from the market. So that's my short term case is I'm worried about a, a sell the news event. And what I'm worried about with the sell the news event is Oh, but if all the wealth advisors put 1% of all the money that they have, you know, Bitcoin will go up well over $100,000. Yeah, except if we have a sell the news event and it goes down 30%, then the advisors are going to go, scam, next idea. And, you know, look back at it in a year and see how it's going from that point. Uh, So that's why it's very important, I think, that in the first month or two after the approval, you don't get a sell-off because then all your assumptions about all these advisors can put 1% of their money in it. No, they're not. No, they're not. If they were going to put 1% of their money in it, it's already in micro strategies. It's already in the Grayscale Trust. It's already in probably a foreign listed spot ETF. They found ways to do it already, those that would do it. 
The only other ones you're going to drag in are just going to be the pure Momo players because the price is going up. So that's my first fear. My second fear I'm going to express as a question to you, Mike. What I am so bullish about with the crypto space is decentralization. I love the idea that it can't be permissioned. It can't be censored. I love what DeFi is attempting to do uh, with uh, decentralization and permissionless. Heck, you might know a little bit about the word permissionless. You run a conference called, uh, called that as well, too. What I'm afraid of is everybody's given up or is putting that as a backseat to number go up. Let's all just get everybody into a regulated investment vehicle, an ETF that trades on a regulated exchange, um, you know, like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. And so we're going to get all these people through the regulated channels to buy regulated products on a regulated exchange. And we've accomplished nothing. We're never going to get to def- we're never going to get to permissionless or decentralization if that's what you think this space needs. This space needs to be an alternative. If all you're going to do is do a regulated product or a regulated exchange through all of the rules, then I got to then let's make this really easy. Let's shut down all the blockchains, let's shut down everything. Let's just run a server at the Fed. And let's just run all of the crypt, all the digital currencies through a server at the Fed and they can permission us because, you, you know, your brokerage statement is going to get permissioned. Your bank is going to permission you. The New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ is going to permission you and censor you. And we're getting away from decentralization. And so what I'm afraid of is we are losing the narrative because, as my friend Ben Hunt likes to say, it's Bitcoin trademark. Just number go up. That's all we want. Just make that damn thing go up. I don't care what what we have to violate in terms of our uh, precepts and our core values in order to get that number to go up. And so I kind of see these Bitcoin ETFs as a sellout. And I think that they're, yeah, they're great for number go up now. But I just don't see how this is going to spark massive innovation because if anything, it could be a sap on innovation. Oh, who needs that? List another ETF on another regulated exchange to drag more money into this thing. That's what we want. We're never going to get to where we want to be with the crypto space. So what say you about the the long-term prospects of decentralization and permissionless and censorship if we're going to all chase everybody in through a regulated exchange? traded fund on a regulated exchange? Yeah, I think so. Two things. So one, to respond to your uh, buy the rumor, sell the news prediction, I have no ability to predict any of this. So I'm going to go ahead and say you might you might be right about that in the short term. I do think in the long term, when I say even let's call it midterm. So let's say a year to year and a half. I feel like there's no way that this isn't bullish for for the price of Bitcoin. So I that's that's sort of how I view it. I I have no alpha in forecasting short term stuff. So I, I think you might be right about that. In terms of in terms of the the decentralization stuff, look, blockchains are at their very core. What they are is systems that allow us to socially coordinate better with one another. And overall, I think they represent a better system, better technology. Uh, that supports human coordination that exists today. I think it was going to be natural that there was going to be some pushback, right? We've spent many hundreds of years actually building our current systems of coordination. There was always going to be some resistance, either because you're an incumbent and you have a lot of revenues that are dependent upon that system, or because you just have a totally different mental model for controlling things. Um, and I actually think there's a lot of like very legitimate pushback on things like uh, like blockchains. Like there are, look, there's good reason actually why we, uh, try to control the flow of illicit money around the world to fund things like terrorism or kitty porn or whatever. You know, when you really dig into the weeds of what governments have to deal with, it gets pretty dark, actually. So I understand that there's very legitimate pushback to that. But ultimately, I think um, what we've done with with blockchains is we've laid the groundwork for a new and better form of coordination. I think my theory about this for a while has been we're waiting for some sort of Overton window. At the end of the day, society has to wake up and say, we prefer these systems. And the good news, I mean, the, the bittersweet, the good news, bad news is I think all the groundwork is laid for that Overton window shift. I see it all the time, right? I see it in the way that central banks are just debasing money. You know, we haven't talked about the $2 trillion run rate of deficits that we're doing. 
Uh, we haven't talked about the surveillance programs that governments are laying out in, in fiat world. I think the groundwork is already there. I think there was always going to be like a one step forward or two steps forward, one step back um, in terms of like traditional wrapper. I think this was part of like an inevitable compromise. Um, but I think the groundwork has been laid for better systems. I'm not going to pull my hair out about, you know, if we, how many people use a Bitcoin ETF versus not. I think eventually we're going to get there and the process was always going to be slightly messy. Um, and that's that's ultimately how I view it. I view it as an inevitable force. And I don't think uh, a Bitcoin ETF wrapper is ultimately going to change that. Honestly, at the end of the day, one thing that people used to debate about that I don't see at all anymore, an ETF is pointless for Bitcoin. <laughs> it makes no sense, right? Like the whole point of an ETF is that it's a better wrapper to trade something that's underlying. Um, and the reason originally for ETFs was that it's a tax advantaged structure compared to something like a mutual fund. You don't need that with Bitcoin. The whole point of Bitcoin is that you can send peer to peer. Um, it's extremely divisible. It's extremely liquid. At the end of the day, this is kind of like putting lipstick on a pig, I think is the expression. It doesn't really ultimately make sense. The only reason why we're doing this is because there's a preference for boomers that have the majority of the money to own this asset in this particular wrapper. But over time, I, I think that uh, younger people don't really necessarily feel like that. That's the way that the whole thing is going. And I think it'll be, yeah, if I had to give you like a long-term prediction is that the ETF is ultimately meaningless. Um, really what it means is just that this is kind of a signal that this is not criminal money and all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, I doubt that most people end up owning Bitcoin through an ETF. Um, I think it's kind of a useless wrapper. It's more of a symbolic victory than anything else. And I'm not actually particularly worried about him, how it impacts decentralization. Well, fair enough. Uh, fair enough. Just a couple of quick points on that. Um, I, you know, one nuance about the Bitcoin ETF is that the um, uh, SEC is pushed back about payment in kind and they're, they're, they don't want payment in kind. What payment in kind means is all ETFs have a payment in kind rule. So if you own an ETF and you go to redeem your money, the ETF could elect to give you the underlying shares in that ETF. Now, payment in kind would mean you go to redeem your money. They could say, you know, open up a, open up a wallet and we'll, we'll send you some Bitcoin. And the, and the SEC said, no, in this case, you have to redeem them in cash. So it is further <laughs> removed it from the market. You know, that, you know, that payment in kind was an important tool in there because it kept it anchored because... At the end of the day, you want out of the S&P, SPY, if everybody wants out, you're not necessarily going to get cash. They're going to give you 500, they're going to give you shares and 500 stocks is what they'll wind up giving you in the proportion that you own. They could give you Bitcoin. So, they, so they're further removing it from that. And my other comment to you about that is, I understand government's needs to try and restrict terrorism financing, drug financing, porn financing, and no one is against that. Uh, I'm not against that at all, but I will say that the reality of the situation is a lot of the rules that we have are very ineffective. I, I look around the world and I say, uh, is there a lack of terrorism because of money or a lack of drugs because of money? Nope. They're finding ways to get around those rules right now. So to scream and yell that without it, that, you know, cryptocurrencies are going to allow terrorism financing. They're doing just fine in the trans in the TradFi world right now and getting all the financing that they need. And that they are not sitting around waiting for a cryptocurrency so that they can ratchet up terrorism to another level. They're already there right now. I, I mean, you you're preaching to the choir. Um I've been shouting about that for for years. Yeah. I just I think KYC AML is just a failed program. It actually just frustrates me. Uh, it really deeply frustrates me. Me too. Me too. I, to, I'm very to just, frustrated by it. You know, it's just one of these things where, yeah, I mean, the average person who hasn't educated themselves about this doesn't know that, right? So this is such an effective talking point for senators to get on the air and say, this is financing terrorism. And it's just, it's not. But but I but I do think where there's a kernel of of truth, and this is ultimately a choice that society has to make if they want to make these trade-offs really the least popular thing, and it was one of the original promises of crypto is privacy. Are we going to get privacy or not? And this is the thing where it's very difficult to decide, okay, everyone, right? We'd all like, let's take our social issues here. We're against financing terrorism, right? We don't like that. We don't like financing kitty porn. There's this whole gray spectrum of gray area in between where I think once you list off those those two big things that no one agrees with is there's a whole bunch of stuff that's gray area where a lot of people might say, I don't actually like this. Like, I'm not going to make a comp like guns in the United States, 
porn, payday lending, all of these sort of weird gray area industries. And honestly, something that's a really bipartisan issue in the US outside of spending more money and we don't like China is we don't like privacy. We don't particularly care for it. And we as a society need to wake up and ultimately say, I prefer privacy. And one of the things that I would disagree with, I, I love Ben and Ben's been on the show. Um, but I think there are sort of two ways to, to look at the world or something like finance, which is this behemoth that it sort of eats and ultimately ends up corrupting everything and kind of brings it within its orbit and then ultimately changes and dilutes it, which is, I think, how Ben views the world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. But I have a slightly different view, and this might be a young person optimistic take, but my view is that the world of finance is already broken. I think the the seeds are the, the there are the cracks in the foundation. Um, I think that ultimately the that's already sown the seeds of its own destruction. And I don't mean like everything's going to crumble and Bitcoin's going to a million and the US dollar is going away. I don't believe any of that stuff. And frankly, I don't want any of that stuff to happen. But I think there's a big enough problem that eventually reform is coming to the system. And I do think some, there's a really great exchange on Twitter. I'll actually link it. I was reading it before the show between Emmett Shear, the interim CEO at OpenAI, and some random novelist on, on Twitter. This is like an unbelievable exchange. I'll, you'll, you'll really enjoy this. But going back and forth about what ultimately ends up changing human society. And there are two groups of people. There are people that think it's policymakers that are sitting and they're sort of technocrats and they're designing society. And that's actually not a particularly good way. And then there's, uh, there's another way that societies change, which is new technology. And society ultimately has to wrap itself around new technology. And new technology is inevitable. People fight it every single time. But I ultimately view this as something that's inevitable. There are trade-offs with this new system, and we're going to have to wrap ourselves around it one way or the other. Um, but- so just a final thought for you. You talked about the Overton window coming for crypto. I think it's here and it's now. And I think the problem is we're a bunch of Americans talking to other Americans. Yeah. You got to look at the rest of the world. The rest of the world does not have, I'm talking about Asia, Africa, Latin America. They don't have the financial system we have. They don't have the monetary system that we have. They don't have the rule of law that we have. And so what cryptocurrencies decentralized finance does is it brings it to billions of people. This, that's where it's going to get its adoption. That's where it's going to come from. If you know, We're the apex predator when it comes to the financial system. We've got the rule of law. We've got the central bank. We've got the reserve currency. It ain't going to start with us. It's going to end with us. It's going to start everywhere else. They're going to say, this is superior to what we have. We're going to start to adopt this, being cryptocurrencies, blockchains, you know, um, um, privacy, no censorship, no permission. Then it's going to grow from that to basically the rest of the world that has a system that it seems to enjoy. So what we, if you really want to get rid of cryptocurrencies, you got to take the system that we think we like and apply it to everywhere in the rest of the world. And we're not anywhere close to doing that. And we've had 150 years to do it. And we're still not anywhere close to doing it right now. So I think that that's really where it's going to come from. So when people talk about cryptocurrencies and what it means, don't tell me what it means to somebody who owns three houses in Connecticut and two Teslas. Tell me what it means to a subsistent farmer in Latin America or what it means to somebody sitting in a refugee camp in Africa. What does it mean for their net worth? Because remember, the refugee in Africa and the subsistent farmer in uh, Latin America, they have mobile phones. They all have mobile phones. So when they get some sort of wealth, what do they? where do they put it? And I think the answer is going to be in a digital account somewhere on a blockchain so that no one can take it from them. And so that's where that's where I think that this stuff is going to come from. It's going to come from that. And it's not going to come from waiting for that guy with all the Teslas and homes in Connecticut to figure out that he wants to close his JP Morgan account, open a MetaMask account. I also really think another dynamic of this is young people versus slightly older people. And, you know, to go back to the point of like what a Bitcoin ETF even means, this is, it's a funny reversal that I just don't think enough people have pointed out. You know, most people are used to an ETF as a wrapper that makes it easier, more tax advantage to trade and hold something. But if you think about it, I actually would view, I would never buy the Bitcoin ETF that I literally would haven't even considered it, wouldn't do it for a second because I'm already set up on Coinbase and there are so many fewer restrictions on owning the Bitcoin spot, the underlying 
that I would actually weirdly be putting much more encumbrances on myself. It's like taking this great new wrapper for money and putting it in a much shittier, older, restricted version of it. And I think ultimately, these are one of these truths that's just going to play out over a long period of time. So again, you know, to that point of, you know, the whole point of decentralized systems is that anyone and everyone can use them um, in whatever preference they see fit. Ultimately, the market or the Overton window or societal preferences or whatever is going to dictate the wrapper that most people want. So yeah, again, I just think this is going to be a slow thing that's going to happen over time. And that's, that's one, one of the things about young versus old. I agree with you on that one, too, because the unfortunate reality is the boomers aren't dying and they're staying in Congress until they're 137 and they have all the money. And that's why the, the young are looking at that system and going, that's not for me because I'm not part of that system. They're not bequeathing the wealth and the power down to the next generations. I mean, um, whether it's 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 political or it's economic. And so they're looking at different ideas for the same reason. Like I said, people in Asia and Latin America and Africa are looking for other ideas as well, too. So I think that it's coming and it will continue to come. But what I'm worried about, again, I hear everything you said. Like I said at the top, I said, I'm very bullish on this space. Now I'm going to shit on it. What I'm worried about is what an ETF was going to do is years you're going to say, oh, good, all the boomers are going to buy these regulated products on these regulated exchanges with all these rules and restrictions. You're not giving an incentive to continue to push the innovation in Bitcoin. You're giving an incentive to create more regulated products and more regulated exchanges and not get away from the existing system to building a, a better system. You're just, you're sucking yourself into that system. And you're, that's why I agree with Ben Hunt. You're corrupting it by bringing it in. That's my concern. Now, I'd love to be proven wrong on this. You know, and this will take a couple of years to see. This is different from the sell the news idea. That's a short-term thing. But I, I'd love to be proven wrong on this. But I, I worry that the Bitcoin ETF is going to set up, if it is successful, a bunch of perverse incentives in the long run. And I would rather see the, the system be built organically, through its decentralized mode that it has been for the last 12 or 13 years. And lastly, I agree with you. I already own all my coins. I got them on a ledger. And uh, I like that I have them on a ledger or in my Coinbase account. I don't need to basically be buying a Bitcoin ETF. I can do it that way anytime I want. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, Jim. Maybe we can do, uh, I know we're, we're winding down here, uh, but I've got a whole, a whole bunch of thoughts for you on that. And I, I would just end it by saying, I'm actually not, ultimately concerned about it. maybe I, I know I actually let me see I know I'm in the vast minority here but my 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 separate viewpoint is that I like I've just again I think the ultimate generational shift that I see right is the boomers are hanging around they have all the wealth today they're holding on to a lot of their money and power people are looking for alternatives you can see it in the coinbase ads I just listened to the Ricky Gervais special last night you are from comedians this is becoming a more known accepted thing ultimately people are going to opt for new sorts of systems. And uh, yeah, I just I just think that there's a there's going to be a preference from especially the younger generation to use uh, crypto native products. But uh, Jim, I, I want to actually talk a little bit about your uh, specific ETF that you launched. So congratulations uh, again on that. Um, and give us give us a little flavor because this is not a, a passive ETF. This is more of an actively managed ETF. Give us a sense of how the launch has gone. You know, if folks that are interested in, and want to check it out, like what is the sort of value prop and all that good stuff? Yeah, so after I crapped on the Bitcoin ETF, now I'm going to uncrap on my <laughs> ETF here uh, as well. All right, so um, what I have actually done is I've gotten into the index business. So I created an index called the Bianco Research Fixed Income Total Return Index. And that index uh, is, is discretionally managed by me and my team and that we have identified it's a fixed income long only index. So it's always in the bond market, long only. We then looked at the factors that we think uh, drive total return in the bond market, whether or not you're overweight or underweight duration, that's your interest rate bet or your yield curve bet or the amount of credit that you own relative to a benchmark. And we overweight and underweight these, we call them tilts, is what we call them on our index. Wisdom Tree has brought out an ETF, WT for Wisdom Tree, B for Bianco, and WTBN is the uh, symbol. It tracks our index. 
is what it does. Now, we are ultimately trying to beat a benchmark, a benchmark of investment grade bonds. Can you do that? I mean, don't 90% of the funds underperform benchmarks? True in the equity space. It's very hard to beat the S&P 500 in the equity space. But in the fixed income space, the index is around the 50th percentile. So about half of the funds, actively managed funds, can beat them um, just straight up. And that the, the reason is very simple. There's a bunch of reasons, but the simple reason is in the stock market, your biggest weightings go to your all-stars, your Apples, your NVIDIAs, and um, your Teslas, and uh, your Amazons. In the bond market, your biggest weightings go to your problem children, the companies and countries that over leverage, over leverage and over borrow and get themselves in trouble. So if you so big to be avoided can lead to our performance. Why now? Because it's a bear market. That's exactly why. There's a yield. I mentioned this earlier. There's a yield again in bonds. That yield needs to be protected. That yield needs to be enhanced upon if you can get total return correctly. So you could start off by saying there's a five or four and a half or five percent yield in the bond market. If you manage that properly, you get to keep that whole yield and maybe add a little bit more on top of that because of total return. That's the promise that the bond market or a total return. Yeah. So even in a rising rate environment, I'm bearish on bonds and I think rates are going to go up because there's a yield that can be managed. There is return. And even with a bear market in bonds, you can see from this point forward, now that we've got the yield, now that the worst total return since the Civil War is behind us, you could be churning out positive returns. Now, I know a lot of people who cares about positive returns. I want to buy Bitcoin and make 100x on my money. You're a different type of money than what we're looking for in this kind of ETF. So, I went back, you know, I've been, I started off in the bond market. I've been in the bond market for 30 years. It's what I know the best. This is um, when it came to constructing this index, I said, I'm going to go with what I understand and how I want to play it. And it is a very hot area right now. Um, actively managed ETFs, so although we're an index, we're a discretionally managed index with a tracker on it, WTBN, but, you know, actively managed ETFs and the like, and bond funds are a very popular area precisely because there is a yield again, and that yield needs to be managed. In a bull market, you can buy the index because you're looking for capital gain in a bull market. In a bear market, you're looking for yield preservation. And that's kind of the idea of why we thought now was a good time and how we put it, um, how we put it together. Been very happy with the way that it's been going. It listed WTABN listed on December 20th, uh, and the reception has been uh, very good and been very pleased with it. So thanks for asking about it. Excellent. Well, guys, uh, you know, you've definitely heard Jim on this program, and I'm sure many others. And um, I would highly recommend that you go check out the, the ETF, especially if fixed income is something that makes a lot of sense for you. So we can link uh, that in the show notes and highly recommend you go check it out. Um, but Jim, thank you very much for joining me and prognosticating. Here's and the noise you heard in the background. This is the noise you heard in the background, by the way. The happy kitty. <laughs> yes, exactly. uh, we're going we're to keep our fingers crossed that these uh, predictions do better than the ones in 2023. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm hopeful that they will. I'm optimistic. Well, you know, if I if I could just say something for people to think about, whether my predictions are right or wrong, I do really firmly believe that you need to ask yourself a basic question: Did something change in 2020 that has a lasting effect? If your answer is no then yes, dust off how the world worked in 2019. And that's what we're returning to. And that's what most people think. If the answer is yes, things have changed. Remote work, you know, deglobalization, energy as a weapon. Have those things changed the world? Then anybody th looking for a forecast that's based on returning to 2019 is going to be wrong. So that's the basic question you got to ask yourself. What changed because of 2020? going forward from here. I think things have changed. Change is not worse. Change is different. And that's why I think that these forecasts that I keep assuming we're going to return to 2020, 2019 haven't been working out. A really good place to end it, Jim. Thank you so much again for coming on and cheers to a good 2024. Same to you. Thank you.